Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the S. Davis and Catherine Phillips Lecture. Uh, uh, the Phillips family uh, established this lectureship to enable the Duke community to um, hear important international speakers on topics of uh, relevance to our community and to the world, and we're very pleased this afternoon to have with us uh, Miguel Insulza, who is the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Secretary General Insulza is giving, as you know, the Phillips Lecture. Um, Dave Phillips has just been, I should mention, today, confirmed by the Senate as ambassador to Estonia. So this is a somehow a auspicious, it's not close to Latin America, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it ends in a vowel, what can I say? <laughs> Um, the ideal of public service is reflected in one of the core themes of Duke's strategic plan, which is putting our knowledge at the service of society. To make this theme a realistic possibility for all Duke students, Duke is in initiating, as you know, the Duke Engage program, which will provide support for every Duke student who wishes to do in-service learning, either domestically or internationally. It is our anticipation that many of our students will, in fact, undertake work in Latin America, both uh, with uh, NGOs and in uh, more local projects. Secretary General Insulsa's career is an embodiment of the ideal of public service that we honor. He has a law degree from the University of Chile, did postgraduate studies at the Latin American Social Sciences faculty, which is known as FLOXO, and has a master's degree in political science from the University of Michigan. Like some of us in this room, he began his career as an academic. Until 1973, he was professor of political theory at the University of Chile and of political science at Chile's Catholic University. He also served until that year as political advisor to the Chilean Ministry of Foreign Affairs and director of the Diplomatic Academy of Chile. Following the coup in that year that brought General Augusto Pinochet into power, Mr. Insulsa went into exile for 15 years, first in Rome and after that in Mexico. In Mexico City, he was a researcher and then director of the United States Studies Institute in the Center of Economic Research and Teaching. In 1988, Mr. Insulza returned to Chile and helped to lead a political movement toward democratic elections in 1990. A member of Chile's Socialist Party, part of a moderate coalition of democratic parties, he has held a number of high-level government posts. Under the pres presidency of, of Patricio Elwin, Insulsa served as Chair, Chilean Ambassador for International Cooperation, Director of Multila uh, Multilateral Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Vice President of the International Cooperation Agency. In March 1994, under the administration of President Eduardo Frey, Mr. Insulsa became Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs and in September of that year was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs. In 1999, he came, became Minister Secretary General of the Presidency, and the following year he became President Ricardo Lagos' Minister of the Interior and Vice President of the Republic. You may, may remember that President Lagos spoke here at commencement a few years ago. When he left that post in May 2005, he had served as a government minister for more than a decade, the longest continuous tenor, tenure for a minister in Chilean history. <laughs> That's an interesting fact. Mm -hmm. um, Jose Miguel, Miguel Insulza was elected OAS Secretary General on May 2, 2005, and took office in May 26 of that year. At the beginning of his five-year term as Secretary General, he pledged to strengthen the organization's political relevance and its capacity for action. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary General of the OAS. Thank you very much for this uh, welcome and thank you for your presentation. This is not my first appearance in, at Duke University, actually in 1999, shortly before leaving the Ministry of Foreign Relations, I came here for the Terry Sanford Lectures, I think it was say April, April that year. So I'm very happy to be here again and uh, on this prestigious uh, occasion and I congratulate the new ambassador, of course. Uh, <laughs> I think I hope we, we both bring us good, ourselves good luck in, this, in, our, in our next activities. 
Well, I'm supposed to talk about the challenges for the Americas and the role of the OAS. I will make just a brief description of the OAS as I see it first, and then go into the more broadly uh, complex issue of the challenges. First, uh, uh, the OAS, as you know, is the, the oldest political organization, international political organization in the world. Actually, it was born in the last decade of the 19th century under the name of, Inter -America, of, of Pan American Union. It had its first secretariat in Washington, uh, starting in the, about 1910. In the same building it still occupies today. And it changed into an organization of American states in the years of the, of the post-Second World War, in which most of the international organizations that existed then suffered some major changes. So it's probably, it's probably reasonable to say that uh, it has undergone some very, uh, very precise peri periods. One is precisely the Inter-Pan-American Union. Then the period of the Cold War. And in the period of the Cold War, which was fairly, uh, I mean, went from 48 from the foundation to uh, the end of the 70s, the end of the 80s, excuse me, the OAS was a very much an aligned organization. Even though its goal has always been peace and democracy in the region, it is uh, certainly a, a fact that the OAS was uh, uh, very much uh, involved in several events that happened in the region during the years of the Cold War and were very much uh, marked by that experience. Uh, it was uh, the OAS that decided to exclude Cuba in the, in the 60s of the organization. It was the OES that legitimized the, several of the, of the other events that occurred in the region in that decade. And it was, the, the, and I would say, the last uh, occasion in which the OES really acted in the, in, the, in, the, in the hardest year of the Cold War was probably the Santo Domingo uh, in invasion. And that uh, marked a certain decay for the organization. People began to feel that the organization was too much aligned, that as, as, the, as a democratic or populist or nationalist or whatever movements appeared in the region, a lot of people started seeing the, the organization of American states as some, something alien to them, especially when the years of the Alliance for Progress passed and the organization did not, uh, uh, we lost many of the, of the activities they had to do with, uh, that had to do with development. But actually with the end of the Cold War, the OAS took a new, a new role. Uh, most countries, most member countries began looking again at the big issue, of the, at the big issue of democracy at the center for democracy for, for the Organization of American States. Uh, most countries were coming out at, in the years of the Cold War of two processes that were very important in Latin America at that moment. One, the fall of the dictatorships in the South. Latin America, as you know, South America, as you know, had practically only dictatorships in those years, except for uh, for Venezuela and Colombia, all the other countries were uh, passed uh, underwent a period of dictatorship. And in Central America, there's the war, the, 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 the wars of Central America, the internal wars that ended with the process that opened precisely by the end of the, end of the 80s with the, uh, the, the Arias Peace Plan, the Gesquipulas uh, agreements and all those. So the, the region was ripe for democracy. Other, other, in the meantime, other members have joined, had joined, that was a second factor. Other members that joined, uh, the OAS was not, all, not just the US and the Latin Americans, which has been usually been its seal, but rather also included the, 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 the Caribbean countries, today group in the CARICOM, the 13 Caribbean countries, and, the, or, and the Canada. And the third difference was that in spite of all its shortcomings in the 80s, the, 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 the Organization of American States had played a major role played a major role in the defense of human rights in the hemisphere. I would say that was its uh, most relevant feature to join and to be a center of the democratic process going on in the continent, that in spite of the fact that many countries that formed the Organization of American States uh, have, had been, had, were or had been dictatorships, uh, in spite of that, the Organization of American States was very relevant in the defense and promotion of human rights in the continent, and that gave her a, a very special role in this area. So uh, in the, in the 1990, 1991, the movement to, uh, to, uh, re to, re to strengthen the Organization of American States as a, a democratic organization, 
It began in Santiago de Chile with a new statement on the matter and it culminated in a very momentous date when on the 11th of September of 2001, in Lima, Peru, all the countries of the, of the Americas signed the uh, Inter-American Democratic Charter. The Secretary of State of, uh, of, of this country was present, as you know. She signed the statement and returned immediately to, to, the, to his country for the, for the, because, because of the, of the, of the uh, terrible uh, occasion it, the, the, the world lived on that day. And since then, I would say that this, in this third period, the post-Cold War, the Organization of American States have been very much tied with the basic goal and basic notion of democratic rule. The, in spite of the fact that the, that the charter of the, the, the democratic charter is, has a, several complexities and several problems, it is a very clear statement of what democracy is and therefore what rules every country should abide by if he wants to be a member of the organization, he wants to participate in the democratic community of the Americas. Uh, it was written at the moment in which there was, a, uh, I would say, a lot of argument in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world around what the concept of democracy itself was. Most of you have read, have probably read or participated to some way in some de that debate. Farid Zakaria opened probably that new occasion of the debate in 1997 by publishing an article in Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, called The Rise of Illiberal Democracies, and putting in front of us the notion that there, was, there were several countries in the world that were elected democratically, therefore, I mean, that they were elected, elected legitimate, in a legitimate way, in fair and free elections, and secret vote, but uh, they did not behave democratically. They did not behave, in, I mean, and probably even by majority could suppress the rights of the minority, could eliminate the independence of, uh, of the other powers of the state, of state uh, uh, other constitutional powers, could change the constitution wherever they wanted to stay in power. And therefore there was an argument if those countries could be called democratic or not, in spite of the fact, I repeat, that they were very much a, there was no discussion to the fact that they were elected democratically. Iran was, of course, the big example for Farid Zagaria, and uh, Fujimori's Peru, in the case of Latin America, was his big example. Of course, other, other, other events in the region had not still taken place. That was in 1997. The Democratic, the Democratic Charter of the Americas took a very clear uh, step in this, this, in this sense. And in spite of the comments I'm going to make later on some of the, of the contents, it defined democracy not in a theoretical way. It just said what are the basic elements of democracy from the point of view of the, of the kind of countries that signed that declaration. And of course, it included democratic elections, but it also included the rule of law. It also included the separation of powers, the existence of political parties, respect for human rights, freedom of expression, transparency, and not corruption in government. And at the same time, considering all these elements of democracy, the Charter put a very strong accent in the linkage between democracy and development. I mean, not necessarily saying that the country that was not developed could not be democratic, but just saying that it is very hard to have a democratic government when the basic needs of the people are not at least being considered by those governments. So the Charter does not say that uh, uh, de development or, 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 or elimination of poverty are uh, absolutely requisites for democracy, but it does, says, does say that democracy is expected to improve the condition and the quality of life of people. And frankly, I think that in these years, most of what we have done has been uh, uh, marked by this whole notion of the Democratic Charter of the Americas. And therefore, when we, uh, when we examine the situation in, in Latin America, we examine the challenges of, uh, of the region, we have to consider this, uh, these basic notions. And I want to be referring, therefore, to when I refer to the challenges, we'll be speaking more about the political aspects than about other aspects. 
But I think very much that also the development and other issues having to do with, uh, with crime, for example, with, with, with violence, with peace, uh, are built into the notion of democracy also of the Americas in these years. Now, uh, let me start by saying, uh, uh, this is just as a, uh, just as a, as a preamble to discuss the situation of the region today. I would say that uh, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of misgivings and uh, concerns in this country about what's going on in Latin America and the Caribbean today, looked at it from the point of view of the region, and the last years have been quite, uh, quite positive. If you take, for example, the economic side, the, according to the Economic Commission, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the GNP of Latin America grew last year by 5.3%. And uh, this is the fourth year, the fourth consecutive year of growth. And uh, in the last three, this has been over 4%. And of course, someone will say, but if I compare that with other regions of the world, that's not enough, <laughs> probably. But if you compare it with Latin America in the, in the past 25 years, it's more than enough. The average for the period between 1980 and, nine, and 2002 in Latin America and the Caribbean was 2.2%, which I think is very much in the basis of, four, of uh, of most of our problems today. Now, uh, this year we expect, we still expect a reasonable growth around 4.7%, and that will close the period from 2003 to 2007 with, uh, near, with a, a accumulated increase of 15%, which is quite reasonable, quite good for, the, for this region. And uh, considering also that other, other variables such as increasing, an increase in exports, a drop in inflation, a rise in the terms of trade have very much uh, improved the condition of the, of, the, of the continent. And this has, a, has an impact. We're going to talk about poverty, of course, in Latin America, but let me begin by putting at least one, one good note. Uh, if you take the period that goes, again, from 2002 to 2006, you have uh, the figure of poor in the region, falling from, uh, from, 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 from uh, to, to, to by, by 18 million people. There are 18 less poor in Latin America in 2006 than in 2002. And you, you take the extremely poor, which are about 40% uh, of the first group of the, of the poor, those have fallen by 19 million. So they said the, 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 actually the process of uh, of reduction of extreme poverty has been faster than the process of reduction of poverty. And that has to do with two aspects, with economic growth. Let's face it, it has to do with economic growth. You cannot eliminate poverty without growing economically. But also has to do with the programs that governments have started to alleviate the condition of the poor and of the extremely poor. Of course, Let's stop here and say that there are still 205 million poor in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I will be referring to that in the next, in the next moments. And this, this improvement of the economic situation is accompanied by, great, by much greater political stability. Just, just two things about this. When I joined the Organization of American States as Secretary General, the government, as you know, we had a very precarious situation in Haiti. The government in Ecuador had just fallen. Actually, I was elected, as you know, in two different rounds of votes. It was a tie in the first one, and then came the second one. There were two different governments of Ecuador in each of the, <laughs> of the rounds of vote. The two of them voted for me, by the way. But, <laughs> but, just, but uh, so that's two. The government of Bolivia announced uh, the, its resignation during the days of the assembly, when I was uh, about a week after I took office. And we had to run to Nicaragua because uh, uh, there was a possibility, a strong possibility of the government being also deposed at that moment. Legally, of course, because the situation has changed. I mean, the procedures to, uh, to eliminate, the, the, to, to, to change governments are not anymore the coup. 
or the, or the revolution, but at any rate, it was a sign of instability, a quite strong sign of instability. And when th that was the situation in the middle of 2005. There have been no more uh, of this situation since in the last two years, and that's a good, a good sign. And the better sign is the fact that between December 2005 and December 2006, we had 13 presidential elections in the region. And that's, uh, that had never happened before. Uh, we have only 21 countries who elect, elect president. So a majority of them elected new, elected or re-elected their presidents in those years. And in general, one must say that in spite of some results being really very close and surrounded by a lot of tension, most of the atmosphere for the elections was uh, democratic normalcy. And that, has, that, that didn't happen in Latin America in any previous, previous period of its history. Uh, a, a couple of decades ago, we didn't have 13 democracies among these 20, 21 countries, let alone that elected the government in the same year. Uh, much less, the, the, much, or worse, the possibility that, the, that they, they, the, the, the victory of the opposition would be recognized, that has happened five times this year, was not, was not there, and uh, nobody was willing to accept changes by democratic, or very few were willing to accept changes by democratic, by democratic procedures. Uh, I, was, I would add to this in democratic terms, that in spite of some very uh, bad polls that circulated a couple of years ago, if you look at the annual survey of Latino Barometer of this year, dated on December 9, 2006, the percent of the population of Latin America believes that democracy may have its problems, I'm, I'm quoting, but it's still the best form of government. That was in, 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 in 2005, and in 2006, the number of, that, of those believing that democracy is still the best system of government rose to 74% from 68%. However, I think that in spite of that, I must admit, that it is still to find in the, in, the, in the outside of the region many assessments that says that in spite of the economic growth, in spite of the decline in poverty, in spite of the improvement of other, democratic, of other economic variables, in spite of the demo, of democratic rule, you have very few, few people really willing to say that Latin America faces a promising future. Frankly, if you look at some of the of the prognosis for the years 2020, or the, or the studies of the situation in the world, Latin America is still being looked very much in a marginal way, and feeling that it's, uh, it's not really going to make it, probably. So the real problem is what, are the, is what we should discuss now, is what are the real problems? <laughs> I don't think that the real problems are that you elected somebody from the left, or you elected somebody from the right, because most of our governments face more or less the same difficulties. And it's very important to have clear what the difficulties are and what uh, can be done to improve on them. And I think that, uh, and I will probably end by, the, in, end by that at, at, at a certain point, that the ba basic challenge that, 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 uh, that Latin America faces today have to do with the quality of governments, have to do with politics and the capacity to build modern societies in a continent that in spite of everything is changing for the good and is improving its condition in which people believe in democracy and in which there is economic progress. Now the first challenge is the challenge of growth. When a region begins to experience a significant cycle of growth, such as the one Latin America is having after long periods of stagnation, the first question is not how big growth can get but what can be done to keep it from reversing? Because we have been there before, probably not in these sizes. But at the beginning of the 90s, there was a period of economic growth. There were a lot of economic changes. Everybody, everybody said that things were going to get better, but the economic cycle soured and growth declined. And one wonders, wonders if it's still, if, the, if the, the, this cycle is still driven, is driven exclusively by exclusively by external factors, such as the high prices of some of the region's major, major exports, 
And if these circumstances, when they disappear or diminish, will bring the, the continent into crisis again. Now, the first thing is that I think that we are better prepared to handle the crisis today than we were in the past, thanks to more sound economic policies, which every country, right, left, or center, pursues at any rate. Uh, countries are uh, taking advantage of prosperous times to pay parts of their external debt. Uh, the burden of debt has diminished a lot in terms of GDP and in terms of, G of regional exports. The countries have also reconfigured their international reserves. The declining dollar degree of dollarization of several economies in the, in, the, in, the, in the region is also reducing the vulnerability of our economies. Some, in some, to some extent, some countries have improved their uh, insertion in the world economy also, and are more prepared, therefore, to face the shocks that can come from some region or the other. However, we still have some problems. The fragility of our financial systems is far, by far one of them. The, the, high, the insufficiency of our infrastructure, our yet insatisfactory insertion in the global marketplace, our unreliable energy supplies, the weakness of our internal markets, this has to do with poverty, of course, I mean, the weakness of our internal markets. I mean, Brazil is not a 200 million person market, it's a 120 million person market. The rest are out of the market. The weakness of, 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 of and the, 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 and probably uh, the fact that we still have a long way to go in terms of regional integration, especially among the largest countries of the region. So we have to, we have a, 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 a high order in front of us. If Latin America is going to, con to sustain growth, to continue growing and to sustain growth, it must be more competitive, promote technological innovation, gain access to more markets, eliminate barriers to the creation of new companies, offer more incentives to small and medium-sized businesses, promote more foreign investment, foster more internal savings, create internal conditions that facilitate our insertion in international markets. Now, we must recognize that there is some kind of uncertainty that does not help overcome these challenges. If people that are, I mean, I, I always say that the, most people who invest, at least from the Western world, usually would like to have stable democracies as countries, as, 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 as uh, sites of their investment. The second choice is stable autocracies. And the worst choice is unstable democracies. And if you have the degree of uncertainty that is created sometimes in terms of rules of the game, of stability, that will probably not attract capital, especially when we need capital for some long-term investments, such as the, one in, the ones in infrastructure. The rhetoric that sometimes is very good in politics does not give investors the security that they need. In other regions of the world, this is not so. China is unanimously considered to be a decisive player in the future, in the future world economy, and India is praised for its strong growth and considered to be a clear leader in the technological, the most technologically sophisticated industries of our times. In spite of the fact that India has still higher rates of higher rates of illiteracy and malnutrition than most of the, of the rest of the world, and China has a higher poverty rate than Latin America and the Caribbean. But the, and the, so the question is, why don't they, do they project an image of progress and hope for the future when we don't? In my opinion, it's basically because they project an image of greater stability and of greater political certainty. And this even affords them a better relationship with foreign capital, despite the fact that their laws are not radically different from ours. The issue is, are they willing to? To run by their laws, are those laws going to be stable? Is the political system going to continue to be stable? Is the political system going to respond? These are the challenges of growth. And they are very much linked to the challenges of inequality. If you compare Latin America and the Caribbean to other regions of the world, 
This is not the poorest region of the world, which is probably why it's a mistake to compare it with other regions. Latin America comparatively has better, a, a better uh, per capita income than several of the developed regions of the world. As President Fernando Enrique Cardoso said about, ten, about more than a decade ago, referring to Brazil, he said Brazil is not a poor country, Brazil is an unfair country. And that stands for all Latin America. <laughs> Latin America is not poor. It's actually, if you take uh, the GMP of Latin America, or the, or, the, the, or the per capita GMP of Latin America, is more or less the average of the world. But it's a very unfair continent, as the figures which we mentioned before show. I mean, that continent should not have around 40% of the population under the, line, under the line of poverty. And now this inequality uh, is not only uh, from Latin America with the rest of the world, it's also very unequal inside Latin America. For example, take one very poor country of Latin America, Bolivia. The poorest 20% of Bolivians, which is a poor country, take home 2.2% of national income. <coughs> on the other side, on the, on the other extreme, you have Uruguay, in which, which is not that poor, but in which the poorest 20% take home 8.8% of national income which makes some countries in Latin America extremely poor also, and some populations completely unable to bear the burden of that poverty for much longer. Only 61% of the people of the region have basic levels of education. Excuse me, 61% of the people in the region have basic levels of education or, or, or less. And most of the people who had uh, whose parents did have, have this, level, this level of education, have gained access to higher education. So only of the, of the people that go to call to the universities in Latin America today, 9% have parents who have gone through the university, I mean, who, have gone to, who have not gone through the universities. So this is inherited poverty. In some countries it's changed. In Chile, for example, the amount of people going to college without their parents having gone to college is much higher, but in some countries practically no one who doesn't have relatives in the university has ever gone to higher education. Now, there, this is a region in which also, I should say, uh, poverty and inequality have a color, have a gender. We speak about 200 million poor, 205 million poor. Uh, of the 75 or something, around 75 million in the indigenous population of Latin America. Uh, most are poor, a vast majority are poor. And of the 150 million of, uh, Afro, Afro, of, of, of American, Americans of African descent, a vast majority is also poor. And of the poor homes of Latin America, in this case, I'm talking about Latin America. They have statistics for the Caribbean. Of the poor homes of, the, of, the, of, of Latin America, a vast, major, a large proportion, a disproportionate number, are monoparental homes headed by women. So poverty has a gender, and poverty has a, has, a, has a color. It's not just poverty. It's also poverty linked very much with discrimination. And this, of course, creates a, one of the biggest problems of Latin America. <laughs> I mean, without really making strides in matters of, uh, of poverty, to which, for, for, for which we, don't totally, no, no, we, we need certainly to grow and need to fight discrimination very strongly, probably Latin America will continue to have the size of inequality it still has. Third problem, or third challenge. I think that an, emo an emerging problem that poses a growing challenge to Latin America and the Caribbean is the unprecedented growth in criminal activity. It is true that we, in matters of violence, we do have some advantages. We haven't had wars, major wars, for a long time in Latin America and the Caribbean. And at the same time, the political violence that was there only a few years ago has diminished very highly, very much. 
But it is also true that in terms of homicides, we have the highest rate in the world of common homicide. This has to do, of course, with several uh, uh, elements. It has to do with drug trafficking, has to do with organized crime, has to do with youth gangs, has to do with other crimes that are committed in the region. But the mere, that the mere, the mere fact that we have such large scale, such large uh, sizes of violence in a continent in which there are very few wars and very few violent political confrontations anymore is certainly a matter of concern. Organized crime has progressively become more mobile, more flexible, more powerful, more transnational, and threatening. The profitability of organized crime provides vast resources for expansion through corruption. It breaks social cohesion, it divides, it corrupts, it destabilizes, it destroys societies and governments, and has economic consequences. Actually, the st a study by the Inter-American Development Bank uh, estimates the cost of violence generated by organized crime in Latin America and the Caribbean in 15% of GDP, which is an immense, an immense sum. Of course, you'll take some, in some other countries, violence is more than that. Yes, in countries that are at war, violence is more than, I mean, accounts for, for, for more than 15% of the GDP. But in a country, in a region, in which that doesn't happen, is an, an enormous, an enormous uh, number. We still continue to operate very much with, within a framework of impunity. And we still say, therefore, we have difficulties in organizing well our police, our public security. Uh, we still have a lot of fear in victims, a lot of, impu of, a lot of, uh, of threats, a lot of threats against uh, uh, freedom of expression. And uh, criminal organizations continue to thrive in some countries, though I should say again that this is very different from one country to the other. Probably uh, crime is much more concentrated in some countries of the region than in others, but it's still a matter that should concern us all. Now, the big problem here, I mean, from my point of view, however, the problems begin with the, with the uh, last two challenges. Fourth major challenge is what I would call good governance. These uh, situations that have arisen in Latin America in, past, in recent years cannot be truly called crises that were caused by revolutions or military coups. This is no general that wants to take power or no revolution is assigned to, 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 to over overthrow the system. They have emanated from situations of popular discontent that wound up being expressed in tumultuous ways. And this discontent is widespread among common people who become increasingly, increasingly impatient with the inability of governments to cope with their problems. Even though they may have elected governments democratically or in adherence to the Constitution and the law. Governments are not, have not been able to deliver, and the people don't want to have them because, because they feel that democracy is not giving them what they think they are entitled to. Policy making is not just a matter of ideas or values. It's more, much more important a matter of results that benefit the people. I mean, the quality of politics is measured, believe, whether we were accepted or not, not because of the, of the, of the logic of the, of the, of the ideology, or of the promises of the candidates, how much, what did it give to the people? How, much, how many people, how, how many problems did it solve? It's a matter of results. And this is where many of our governments and some of, some, sometimes our political elites fail. It's not enough to feel or act like a Democrat to, to make good government. The challenge is to keep the stability of democracy while providing solutions to people's problems. And for this, of course, there are some basic requirements. One requirement, of course, is it an institutional requirement. I mean, we have very, we have very uh, well-meaning governments, well, governments with feel of good intentions, but sometimes they don't have the institutions, the political institutions, the systems of representation, the form of organization that is required 
to govern in an efficient way. Many times in our, re our region has a, uh, a strong uh, failure in this uh, process of building government, government institutions. We don't have a tradition, enough, enough tradition of government institutions. On the contrary, we have tra the tradition of uh, 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 informal, uh, of, inf of, of, of informal links inside the government and not of abiding usually by the rule of law and by, st by, by stable government activity. We don't have professional government activity. The quality of a government, the eff efficacy of our bureaucracies is very low. There is, of course, a problem of corruption. I admit that that's, that has been a problem in Latin America. Sometimes, sometimes, I tend to feel, however, that it's, that the basic, the, the initial problem is a lack of transparency. People don't know what the governments are doing. Very few written proceedings exist on what the governments do, on how they work. <laughs> governments are not accountable and our systems of control are cumbersome or inefficient to control what the government is doing. <laughs> and certainly with lack of transparency, the possibilities of corruption are much higher. And we have a lot of corruption, and we not only have a lot of corruption, but we have a lot of people who believe that corruption is even higher than what it really is. That's on one side. But on the other side, we also need governments that are, that are able to, to, to govern, that are effective. The rule of law, the transparency of government, the cleanness of government procedures is certainly a need for Latin American democracies, and we have to improve that. But at the same time, we need governments that are able to govern, to rule their countries in democracy. And that, I would say, is a very uh, unfelt, a very uh, uh, something that most people in the region do not really realize, that the fact that democracy has been <coughs> implanted against dictatorship and against authoritarian rules does not mean that we have governments that should not be able to perform their duties and to exercise some degree of authority in the region. So Latin America very much moves between a problem of government uh, 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 governance, of governance and a problem of legitimacy. We need to face the, the challenges of crime, of inequality, of poverty, of growth, we certainly need more efficient, more modern, more organized, more institutionalized, and more transparent government. But at the same time, we also need governments that can exercise authority effectively in society. My feeling is that when people ask who is, uh, I mean, if, if, if there is a, if, when, 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 when we are, when I am asked when, how, much, uh, how much I believe that the, the continent is going to the right, to the left, to the center, how many changes are happening in Latin America, most countries face this, face this seems the same problems. It's a matter of, uh, I mean, they are faced with the same problems and the same challenges, demands on the government uh, that, say the leftist or the right wing are the same. People want growth, want stability, want alleviation of poverty, want to share the benefits of democracy, want to be protected against crime and against corruption, and want to have governments that are accountable, that are efficient and accountable for their, uh, for their performance. And if not, they'll change them. Certainly, we hope that they will change, us, change them by democratic rule. Certainly, we are not in favor of the continuous stability that some countries still live. As you know, there's one country in the region in which no government has concluded its, uh, its rule in the last 12 years. Nobody can be in favor of that. 
because we need a government that is stable and can rule and can rule the countries. But that will continue to happen unless we are able to uh, establish the rule of law, abide by democracy, we work with democratic institutions, and uh, improve very much the quality of politics in our region. The problem of Latin America is not a problem of resources. The problem of Latin America is not a problem, therefore, of extreme poverty. The problem of Latin America is a problem is, is basically that to face these challenges, we have to improve very much the way in which we perform our, uh, our, uh, our we, 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 we run our political activity, we develop our, we strengthen our democracy, and we strengthen our democratic institutions. I am completely certain that if uh, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, doesn't work day after day to expand democracy in this sense and its institutions, and if we don't use these institutions to directly benefit the majority of the inhabitants of our hemisphere, reasonable men and women will continue to distrust the very democracy that we have, for which we have fought so, so, so hard, and will perhaps not even want it. And the biggest challenge, therefore, the, the challenges of challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean is to prevent this from happening, to have people believe in democracy, because be democracy is, be is delivering the benefits of its actions to the people. Nobody will believe in us if we're not able to perform better governance than the one we have been performing in the last decades. That's, thank you very much. Okay, I would like to go back to the income inequalities in Latin America. Uh, I will give you the Chilean example that I'm sure that you are really familiar, that economic growth has averaged around 5 to 6% in the past 10 years, and the poverty levels, for example, in 1989 was 45%, and today it's around 18%. However, the income inequalities hasn't improved according to the Gini coefficient. But uh, I have asked this question, how to solve these income inequalities. And I remember that I asked to a Harvard economist, Professor Perkins, and he told me it should be good at civil war. I don't know if he was joking <laughs> what, or no. You are talking about Chile, no? Is that no, 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 he wasn't. I was asking no, in no, general. Because, uh, actually, no. Let me say one thing, and I'll take that, because the figures that you're giving, I mean, poverty from falling from 42 to 18, but income distribution not uh, changing very much, is, is in case the case of Chile. In other countries, it, mm -hmm. in general, the, true, the truth is that income distribution has not improved in Latin America, even though we see in the, in the ECLAC uh, figures some very interesting th things happening in Brazil, for example, in the last two years. But in general, you can say, yes, there has been a growth, in some countries more than others, but uh, income distribution has not, uh, has not, imp has not improved. Uh, except for the fact that, for example, in those countries that you mentioned, social services have been highly expanded. I mean, and actually, uh, the, 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 the services uh, available in education, in, uh, in, uh, in health, even in housing, are in some, in some cases much more than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And I believe that you should include, include those at least in some way in a form of coefficient. It's not just a matter of monetary or monetary distribution. Let me give you an example. I mean, uh, most of the people I know, most of the people that, that, that work in education, say that uh, you should have a, it's better to have a good educational system than to have what other, others proclaim, I'm sorry, others, pro, uh, it's me, uh, other, others, uh, others proclaim that, you, that you, should, you should give them just a voucher to go to any school they want. Well, if you give them a voucher, you'll improve income distribution in monetary terms. Probably it's better to have a good public system, a good schooling a public system, 
than to give them vouchers. But if you, you, you invest in a good public system, educational system, that will not reflect in direct income distribution. If you give, if you give people a subsidy for health, give them a bonus or to go to any hospital they want, that will improve uh, monetary distribution. But probably it would be better to have a good public health system in most of these countries where most of the people are poor. So that's, uh, that's relative. But there's one thing that's important from my point of view, just to answer that your question directly. No, I, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go what would I record, what would I say? <laughs> well, it depends what you want, I mean, you, you can, what, you, it, the problem in Latin America, you know, what's the problem in Latin America from my point, in my country, that's it. I mean, we pay 19% taxes. Our tax burden is 19%. In Spain, the tax burden is 38%. In Denmark, it's 53%. Now, you can have social services at 19%, at 38 or at 53, given, I mean, assume that they are all clean and nobody steals the money, of course. But certainly you won't have the quality of service. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that the Danes might be, many Danes might be very happy with their system by which the, which the, the, the tax burden is 53%. But that's their choice. What you can't do is tell people, is promise the people that are going to have the, the services the Danes have while you are only, you are only collecting ta taxes for, for 19%. So some improvement, if, if, if we are going to go from in that direction, we certainly have to change the, the taxing systems. In taxes, in, in there, there are countries, I mentioned the case of Chile is 19%. In the case of Mexico, the tax burden is around 12%. And one thing that's very clear, nobody that's rich pays, pays taxes. I mean, all those taxes are paid by the middle classes. So you say, no, no, but we have to still continue having the, 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 the Servicio de Seguro Social, the Seguro Servicio Social, the medical centers and all that. Well, who's going to pay for that? I mean, I think that that's when, precisely when politics does not offer solutions. I mean, you can have the Latin American solution, the Spanish solution, or the Danish, or the Danish solution. But they cost different kinds of money, different kinds of taxes, and they provide for different services. That has never been made clear. So I'm not pronouncing myself for one or the other. What I'm saying is that let's stop this lie that many people in the continent tell, or they, they tell, tell the, the population that they can have excellent health and, <coughs> health, 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 health and educational services while having a burden of less than 20% of, of taxes in the, in the country, which is much less, by the way, than what's, than what's paid here. Right? Um, it has been my impression that, that the um, latest years in South America, um, there's been a lot of uh, division, uh, a new division, right, uh, in powers, and different uh, countries are somewhat uh, forming blocks, and that doesn't seem to be going towards a very united, united Latin America. And at the same time, uh, international organizations like the UN, for instance, have been kind of... Uh, uh, lost a little bit of credibility, so you're somewhere in between and with your organization. So I wonder, uh, what's the um, what's the what are the options that you have to try to form unity in South America, and how do you pretend or how do you plan to uh, convince governments that, that that it's useful to be united and make a united front to improve the situation? Well, I I said, and I and I will hold that that most countries face the same challenges but they do face them with different resources. <laughs> Some countries, for example, have a, uh, many energy resources. Others don't have them. Therefore, some, some, uh, some uh, countries are better defended on the way the, 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 the world market functions today than others. When I, when I think that the, I mean, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not against ideological disputes, but when I feel that ideological disputes are really messing up things, is when countries that do have resources to face the new realities intend to tell the others what they should do and not accept that they have a different, different cases. Let me be very frank, very clear. I mean, I think that uh, 
We would take a country as Venezuela, for example. Venezuela doesn't want to have a tool that's very important for other countries, which is a free trade agreement with the United States, for example. Now, let's be frank. Does Venezuela need a free trade agreement with the United States? Or if you were the Venezuelan leader, would you, I mean, make any kind, of, it's, it's even a small sacrifice for a free trade agreement with the United States? I mean, they sell all the products that they sell to the United States go in without a tariff. And you take another, let's say, an ideological comrade. I mean, all the, or more than 50% of the exports of Ecuador to, uh, to the United States go in with a preference that without which they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to go in. So Ecuador needs the preferences that Venezuela does not need. I think it's fair, therefore, that they have different policies. What is not fair is that one tries to impose it to tell, to tell the other one that his policy is the best. I don't think that you, that you can force countries to, fo to have follow policies that are not in their convenience. That's why I'm very much I, I'm concerned about the, not about the models that countries are following. I mean, I'm not concerned with the, with the fact that one wants a free trade agreement, the other one doesn't want it, one wants to have a ethanol, the other one wants to have oil. I mean, those are their interests and their problems. But let's not raise the problems of each one to the level of ideology. This is not an, ideolo not an ideological matter. This is a political matter of the convenience for each country. I mean, the countries that do want to, that, that, I mean, this was a discussion, for example, was very interesting in the Summit of the Americas about two years ago. To most people, it was a big discussion between right and left. No, no, it was some countries saying, look, we need to have these free trade agreements because we have to export our products. Others saying, we, of course, we need them, but the conditions is with the, which they are being given, for us, given to us are not the most convenient. That's the kind of discussion we have to have in Latin America. We need integration in the world economy, but nobody should try to impose its own model and its own goal on each one. I think that up to now, that is more or less what has happened. Up to now. But I am concerned about the, the degree of, uh, of, of, the degree of rigidization of, uh, of ideology. Especially when it's imposed by countries that have nothing to lose with it. With it. Because, I mean, if you go to, if you know that the president of Colombia is meeting the president of the United States tomorrow, I bet that you could write an agenda. What, they are going to, what are they going to discuss? They're going to talk about drugs, they're going to talk about the war, and probably they will talk about some economic preferences too and about the free trade agreement which has not been approved by the US Congress. If, you tell you that the, if I tell you that the president of Argentina is meeting the president of the United States tomorrow, you probably say, look, yeah, suppose they're going to speak about the agricultural products and the lack of agreement to eliminate the tariffs or to eliminate the pre, uh, protection to agricultural products in the United States and the damage, the damage that causes to Argentinian agriculture. And if you talk to the president of Mexico, well, he'll have some other problems of migration, etc. What would the Venezuelan president discuss with the president of the United States? There are no, no pending problems. I mean, all of us, us go to a gas station and activate the pumps of the 12,000 gas, gas stations run by the, by the Venezuelan oil company in the United States. And that's fine. I hope that. I mean, if, if, I hope that all other countries would have been so, uh, so forthcoming, uh, so, for, so, 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 uh, so uh, future-oriented to establish the network that they have. Let, they, let them use it. But the other countries need to have a, a different kind of relation and a different kind of policies. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. The problem in Latin America is not that countries, each country, some country wants to do this and some other country wants to do that. 
The problem is that when somebody tries to impose the others or to convince the others that his procedure is the only one that's really going to work. I'm not, I don't think that there's, a, that there's going to be a problem in Latin America as long as we all face the same difficulties we have. I mean, the difficulties I have mentioned, each one is in its own way. If we try to politicize or to ideologize the matter too much, we will probably get into trouble. I don't, I don't believe in blocks, as you may see. By the way, the countries of the so-called block are the poorest countries of the region. And they have to solve that problem some way or the other. So let's, uh, okay, please. Yes. Um, when talking about transnational crime, which is the role that, that the OAS um, can play in that, and which are the opportunities and challenges as an organization that you can? Of crime, you mean? Uh, transnational crime. Mm -hmm. Well, in matters of crime, well, I mean, in all in all matters of crime or, or, or security and development, we only do two things, which is uh, human resources and institutional and institutional strengthening. I mean, we help, we try to help institutions. Uh, I mean, the government is developing better institutions in matters of, uh, of uh, fighting drugs, in matters of, of drug control, customs, et cetera, et cetera, money laundering, et cetera. And we train people to do that. That's what we do, that we have resources to do, and that's about all our, our possible activity. And now, of course, we are opening a new area now in, the, in matters of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, human traffic. Uh, and to improve the situation of human traffic, you have to work with the, with the, with the reality, which is that, believe it or not, 15% of the people in the hemisphere do not have an identity. So they are, very, they are very easy to traffic because they don't exist. And if you open a program on poverty, for example, <laughs> those people will not be able to register because they don't have an identity. And there's a recent study of uh, the, Commission on the, the of Commission on Human Rights revealed that 25% of the, the women in Nicaragua who had suffered abuse and had not denounced it had not done so because they didn't have an identity. They couldn't go to court because they couldn't show the court the way, what, what their name was. And we are trying to, we are, we are working on a very ambitious program now on, on national, on identity, in order to at least to begin setting, putting forward the, the basic tools with which to protect, to give basic protection to the poorest people in the hemisphere. Yes. No, no, I got, I, I, he, you were, okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, what is the current thinking regarding Cuba? Oh. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think I can afford to say here that uh, I've always been in, in, in favor of a, some kind of a dialogue with Cuba. And, but let's leave that aside. I don't think that Cuba wants to join, to rejoin the Organization of American States. And I don't think the issue now is that. that, is that. The problem is this. I mean, Cuba is, to, is bound to undergo sooner or later and probably sooner than later, it, a political transition. Now, that political transition will be marked by a, by a very, very clear situation. I mean, this, the basic source of authority, and therefore stability, uh, of, the, of the political system of that country will have disappeared. I mean, the, 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 un, the uncontested leader will not be there. As, those of us who learn know, know from political science, as we have been discussing here today, uh, we are, what we are trying to create in, in Latin America today, when I, to, to this democratic charter, and also some kind of a democratic legitimacy. Well, Cuba would, will be in need of some kind of legitimacy for its regime. Because the main source of legitimacy will have disappeared. And I think that the possibility of, a democratic, of democratic progress there is very, is very much at hand, provided nobody tries to impose one, but rather to patiently work in the direction of uh, the creation of new, of new conditions and new legitimacies. 
Now that, uh, of course, there's a, there's a, that, that means uh, certainly that we, we, we are not going to, that democracy is not at hand necessarily in, in Cuba. But that's what most of the Latin Americans believe in. And I think that we want, what we want to do is, is to start that process as soon as possible. I already hear some people saying, no, no, but there was already a transition in Cuba, and now Raul is there, and Raul is going to be the same. And then when Raul goes, oh, no, but the new guy went in, and he's going to be the same. And we're never going to talk to Cuba. And in the meantime, we, let me tell you from the point of view of the OAS, it's a more mostly awkward situation when the OAS has 34 members, except Cuba. Cuba is still a member, by the way, just suspended. But of the other 34, 33 have normal relations with Cuba. <laughs> and, uh, and the organization is not supposed to, to, to have any kind of action in that. I don't think that's the best thing. I would really start a, start a dialogue, start a discussion, start seeing what we can do, and start uh, opening. Well, I, would, I must admit that I have thought for a long time that the policy of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of blockade is, is helpful for the dictatorship in Cuba. I don't, I don't never believe that it's really playing a role. But in this moment, I think we must, we must accept that we have to move in a reasonable way if we really want to, to have a peaceful transition in Cuba. And that's what we all want. Nobody in Latin America, let me be very frank with you, nobody in Latin America which you speak to wants really to have some kind of a, uh, upheaval in Cuba. They would like to have a transition to a democratic regime very normally, in which probably, because that's the way it happens, it's a country with which 50, 50, 50 we have, you have lived with the government for 50 years, most of the elites in the, in the, in the country believe to belong to some public institutions. So probably many of them are going to take uh, to play a role there, as they played in Russia and as they played in other countries in, the, in, the, in, the, in Eastern Europe. You have to accept that too. You have to accept that too. And the basis for this is that if, if you don't have, you, you have to find forms of national reconciliation and, uh, and of moving forward uh, in a peaceful way. And I think that we could, we could play, a, a big, a Latin Americans and Caribbeans, and Caribbean people should, could play a, lot, a, a big role in that if we just uh, could convince others that, uh, that we can. Let's take the last question. Uh, actually, yeah, this lady here and then one, one over there. And that's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you were saying before that the GNP of Latin America in general was uh, increasing more than the years before that went up. Uh, mm -hmm. But GNP in general doesn't take into account neither environmental impact or uh, distribution of, of income, and I'm wondering how you're going to take into account the environmental income, or, yeah, the environmental impact. For example, in Brazil, uh, there have been soybean productions that have been cutting much of the rainforest down, which reflects a positive increase in the agricultural sector, but not in the environmental. How are you going to take this into Latin America? Well, one, 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 one thing first, because I, I, I do have this figure, and I want to, to give it to you, of course. As, uh, the first thing is that uh, just just uh, a, 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 uh, an increase in the gross domestic product is not necessarily an increase in in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in per capita income. Huh? In, in fact, is the GNP grew grew by 55.3 percent last year, and the income per in, per, per person it grew by 3.8. I don't know. I don't have exact figures today. But uh, I am told that the first figures that exist in ECLAC, at least for the, some of the larger countries, and in this case, the larger countries will play a major role. Because, I mean, the, the fact that income improves, in Brazil, that income distribution improves a little bit in Brazil, has a, plays a large uh, role in the, I mean, has a, lo a large effect in all the continent. And I'm told that it's, it's, it's improving in that sense. But, for, for, I mean, for income distribution, you have to, to take much, lo much longer periods, and it's hard to say right now how much is improved. Environment is a problem, I agree. There is a lot of resistance in some countries in the region to being what impose what they, what they assume are uh, unfair demands in matters of environment by, uh, uh, by more developed countries. 
I assume that the, the recent study of the United Nations, the one that appeared a couple of days ago, I mean, it wasn't the New York Times, it was everywhere, showing that most of the damage of global, um, global warming uh, caused by the developed countries is going to be suffered by the developing countries, and that most of the money invested against global, to fight global warming is being invested in the developed countries and not in the developing countries, and that's going to create a big, a big problem. I think that, the, that the, I think that, however, that some, some, some agreements could be reached. I don't see the, the Brazil, for example, which is the owner of the, of the largest rain, rainforest in the region, uh, against some kind of agreement, agreement provided that, uh, that all the developed countries enter into that agreement. I, I, in that sense, I, I very much believe that the, the, the review of the, of, the Tokyo, of the Kyoto Protocol, which is next year, by the way, 2008, is the moment to put that forward. I think that developed countries, developing countries are willing to, to work together in these matters, these environmental matters and protection of the environment, uh, provided that, the, that, the, that there is a clear sign of leadership from the countries that, uh, that have to do the larger effort. But I cannot answer this moment how this thing, how, how the, the, the impact on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, the, on, on the environment of development is, is developed. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen any figures on that. And the last one over here. Anyone? I had uh, one very quick question. Uh, the question is that we've often seen that uh, you mentioned India, you mentioned the poverty in India. I happen to be Indian. I'm uh, quite, uh, I'm quite uh, interested to hear which your views are on that. I also feel that um, there is a Latin American scholar by the name of Hernando de Soto who writes in his book, The Mystery of Capital, that because of the Byzantine bureaucracy in Latin America, it becomes very difficult to achieve anything and indeed to move in any manner towards poverty alleviation. My question to you is this. One of the prescriptions in his book has gained a lot of popularity in India and is being considered by the government quite seriously. That is, they believe that all problems are solved, or at least there is a semblance of problem solving if title to land exists. Given that poverty is such an acute problem in Latin America, and in that sense a similarity shared between Latin America and India, <coughs> what, if any, are your governments or, I mean, the government states of the OAS doing to provide uh, land or title looking to reform the ability of the, of the poor in Latin America to actually have access to land so that the other problems can get into line. I just wanted to know your views on that. No, uh, there are some problems on country. I can tell you, for example, in my country, there's a very ambitious program of, uh, of uh, uh, formalization of, of, land, of land property. And I know it exists in some other countries in, 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 in Latin America. Probably you are right, we should have some kind of, uh, together with this uh, program or, or, or side by side with this program on, on identity, we could have a problem of a, a program of regularization, especially of small property. I do believe that. I think it, it does play a very important role, but I don't think it's, a, it's the only matter. Probably access to, to microcredit, which other, other countries have already tried a lot, will all play, would play a similar role. Uh, and that, that, in that uh, direction, we have also been moving. But uh, it, we, 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 I, I agree with you that land, uh, that, uh, that uh, title, uh, tit entitles on land are a very relevant factor. I don't believe they are the only one. I don't believe they are the magic, the magic uh, uh, recipe that's going to solve all the problem. But that's another matter. Last one, last one, yeah. la ultima. Um. Do you estimate that the microcredit or microfinance uh, to poverty and extreme poverty through NGOs or private finance institutions will contribute to the reduction of this poverty? And how developed is this activity throughout through the region? Well, it varies from one country to the other. Eh? Uh, let me tell you that I, I sincerely believe that the, well, I, let, let me just tell you a, a, a small story I've tended to tell an anecdote. When I was, uh, you know, in my country, when in the, everybody goes on vacation in the month of February, and I usually stayed. Well, the president had to go. I was the, 
informally in that case, the vice president, I stayed while he went on vacation. So everybody came to me and said, could you take hold of my portfolio because I'm going on vacation and then the secretary too. <laughs> and once I got six portfolios at the same time, and one was women. And I said, okay, I'll take it over for five, for four days as I've been asked, but I, I want to be sure that I do something. <laughs> and one thing that I did was uh, have a meeting. I invited about 30 women that belong to two different programs of uh, micro, uh, micro businesses, small businesses. One of them was very traditional. It was a municipality near Santiago in which we, women were given tools to, to start their own, uh, their own uh, shops and things like that. And uh, uh, the other ones were problems of microcredit by the state, by the Banco del Estado of Chile. And the difference between both of them was, was amazing. And we were the two, the two different groups. I mean, the, 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 most of this, um, this second group were informals, were informal business, who had gone into the bank one day and had said, one of them, as she told me exactly, they say that you loan money here. Is that true? <laughs> and the gentleman there said, yes, you have to go to that. And she already had a shop with about four people working with her. And she had formalized, she had become formal. She had registered in the tax revenue service and all that. And the number of people who did that in that program was enormous. Enormous. I mean, I think that the big problem with us is that in most cases, it's not that way. <coughs> I mean, if you want to start something, they'll give you a piece of paper and say you have to fill all, all these eight, 12, 13, 15 requirements. And that's one big problem. That, that has to do a lot with efficiency. I, I really am I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, that uh, in Latin America, people do have a lot of, uh, of initiative. And that, that could be done probably by deregulating a lot the way in, in which people start small businesses. And one of those, of course, is microcredit. I think that, the, the, uh, that's, I, I agree that titling is very important, first. But then you have to have credit, you have, you have to have technical assistance, and in the world of today you have to have markets. If you are able to give uh, viable small businesses those three elements, uh, credit, technical assistance, and markets, you will probably have a, have a good start. So I'm not that far away from, from those kinds of ideas. I only think that's not, it's not just one thing. Thank you very Anyone much. Anyone else? Thank you. I didn't want to rush you. No, no, no. I know, but it's, uh, it's late. <laughs> Gil, do I announce the reps? Gil, do I announce the reception now? Right. There, there'll be a reception in the, um, in the lodge, I think they're calling it here. I usually call it the lobby, but uh, whichever one.